Please rise and turn to the Thanksgiving for Baptism on page 97 in the front of your hymn books. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are clothed with God's mercy and forgiveness. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters, and by your word you created the world, calling forth life in which you took delight. Through the waters of the flood you delivered Noah and his family. Through the sea, you led your people Israel from slavery into freedom. At the river, your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By water and your word, you claim us as daughters and sons, making us heirs of your promise and servants of all. We praise you for the gift of water that sustains life. And above all, we praise you for the gift of new life in Jesus Christ. Shower us with your spirit, and renew our lives with your forgiveness, grace, and love. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Please turn to hymn number 659. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Our canticle of praise is on page 99. Please note that there will be a brass uh, interlude.
Let us pray. O oh Lord God, your mercy delights us and the world longs for your loving care. Hear the cries of everyone in need and turn our hearts to love our neighbours with the love of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Saviour and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from Hebrews chapter 8. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach one another. They shall not teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. In speaking of a new covenant, he has made with the first one, he has made the first one obsolete, and what is obsolete and growing old will soon disappear. Word of God, word of life. Today's psalm is Psalm 136. Please turn to it in your hymnal. We will chant it by half verse. I will chant the first half of the verse, and you will respond with, God's mercy endures forever. You'll get it. The second reading is from Revelation chapter 22. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. On either side of the river is the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, producing its fruit each month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Nothing accursed will be found there any more. But the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, 
and his name will be on their foreheads. And there will be no more night, and they need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Word of God, word of life. Please rise for the Gospel Acclamation on page 102. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the fifth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Grace to you in peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Can you understand my accent? Is it? <laughs> I don't know, sure. There we are. Once more, um, thank you to uh, Bishop Susan, um, all of your bishops, uh, the National Church Council, uh, for inviting me to be with you at this um, um, convention. Um, it, it's, I had so much fun in, Ed, in Edmonton four years ago that they, you all invited me back and I said yes, so this was great. And thanks also to Where's the Saskatchewan Synod for adopting me. I, I got to be in the picture, so that's great. <laughs> yeah. I was a little leery when I saw that um, the gospel text was the Beatitudes because everyone has preached on the Beatitudes. Even if you're not a preacher, you've probably preached on the Beatitudes. <laughs> And I remember hearing a story about a pastor who had preached on the Beatitudes, and a woman came through the line to shake hands, and she said, great, more platitudes on the Beatitudes. <laughs> so I'm going to try not to fall into that uh, sort of thing. Um, but they really, are, they really are strange teachings from Jesus. And they are really strange teachings that, that a lot of times we just don't want to hear or we have ideas about what Jesus is trying to say, and I think it is not what our Lord is trying to say. I would say, first of all, that the Beatitudes are, are not welcome or accepted in a lot of places. I mean, we say blessed are the meek, but in our world, the meek don't get the land. They get pushed off into the floodplain or into the really horrible parts of the town. Blessed are those who mourn, but in our world, mourning may be tolerated for a while, but then we say, can't you just get over it? Blessed are the pure in heart, but in our world, such people are dismissed as hopelessly naive. Blessed are the peacemakers, but in our world, or at least my part of our world, those who pursue peace risk having their patriotism questioned. So these are uncomfortable words. You know, the weak, the ones who are the humiliated, the walked out on, have not been given their share of the earth, have been denied access to the world's resources, cannot enjoy the creation that God created for all people. How are they blessed? Those who mourn, they find no cause for joy. The poor in spirit are not those who trust and be God because they have no hope. Rather, they have no hope, full stop. And those who hunger for thirst for righteousness, they thirst for justice that has been denied. These are hard sayings of Jesus. 
that can sometimes be daunting, um, but unfortunately, and especially amongst Lutherans who are the least likely to accept grace, even though we talk about it all the time, um, we turn these into conditions that somehow we must fill in order for God to bless us. I have a, a, a colleague, Marcus Kuhns, uh, back in the ELCA, and he calls this subjunctivitis. So I don't, you ever had conjunctivitis? Do you call that pink eye, you call that up here? Yeah, looks like, okay. We're, we're two people but separated by a common language. I, I wasn't really sure if that's true. <laughs> Usually it's the, us in the English, but. Um, but he says subjunctivitis is when you, you take these verb tenses and you turn them into the subjunctive voice. It's, it's not. The whole thing there, it's in the indicative mood. God, Jesus says, you will, you will be satisfied. You will inherit the earth. You will be called children of God. You will see God. It's not, oh gosh, you know, if I just work hard enough and try hard enough, it's not I could, I, if I could, I would, I should, I ought. Then maybe God will do something for me. This is the subjunctivitis that clouds our eyes. I also call it kind of a transactional religion. So if I do something, then God's going to do something for me, which, you know, that's, that's not possible. But how many of us, you don't have to raise your hands, you could just do it really secretly the Lutheran way. Raise your hand. <laughs> how many of us somehow still don't trust that grace is free and grace is for all of us, that it is in fact too good to be true? So the Beatitudes become a burden, a burden. Or they, they can be turned into a how-to manual for discipleship. If we were just somehow poor and in spirit and meek and uh, all of those other things, that's what we should strive to be in order to be good and effective disciples. But I don't think that is what our Lord is telling us in any of these. That it's not subjunctivitis, that God is not a transactional God, that this is not a how-to manual on how to be the perfect disciple. And that these words are, in fact, unwelcome and, un and unacceptable in a c culture, and I would speak for my own south of the border, that really promotes the autonomy of the individual to the point of, uh, of idolatry. We all believe we can pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, even people who have no idea what bootstraps are. <laughs> probably, uh, this is, I, I'm digressing, probably it's not a liberal stand because Birkenstocks don't have bootstraps, so they probably wouldn't, <laughs> they probably wouldn't try it. So. What they are, what these words from Jesus are, are promises. It's not about our work. It's not about sage words from a great teacher. It's not about moral precepts. It, precepts. it doesn't depend on us. Remember Martin's Luther? M Martin's Rooster, pardon me? I got it mixed up, Martin, sorry. Mar <laughs> Martin's Rooster? The sun didn't come up because of his work. The sun came up because that's a promise, and the sun has risen because that's the promise God has made to all of us. And the promise is that you are blessed. We are blessed. We will receive what God promises. Not that we could be blessed if we earn or even deserve what God may give, but we are blessed. And that, that changes the way I hope that we take a look at and hear the gospel or read the gospel or experience the gospel. And Luther was pretty clear about this. Um, Luther said that the gospel is not a book of laws and commandments which requires deeds of us, but a book of divine promises in which God promises, offers, and gives us all our possessions and benefits in Christ. That's how Lutherans read scripture. And if you, if you want to impress your friends at home, that's the Lutheran hermeneutic. I'm kind of proud of that word, so... <laughs> Interestingly enough, in Matthew, this is Jesus' inaugural address. This is the first public speech that he gives. In Luke, he's in the synagogue, but here, this is his inaugural ex uh, address. And I think it's, it's, it's telling that, that Jesus is laying before us the absolute promise that all of the things that the world despises, that the world sees as nothing, that the world can discount, in fact, are the places where God will most richly give blessings. And it doesn't depend on the person who's doing the, it's not what we do, that this is, this is the promise. And this will be, as we see, uh, Luther called it a, a portrait of, of Jesus as we move through the gospel. 
Now, I'm going to tell you about a funny thing that happened at, after uh, the inauguration down in the States of the latest um, resident in the White House. Um, so it was in February, and uh, an enraged parishioner called our bishop in New Jersey uh, and was complaining about her pastor. She said, I cannot believe, I cannot believe that the pastor deliberately chose a passage from scripture to criticize the administration. And the bishop's thinking, well, what's going on in my parishes? I think you think that sometimes what's going on in your parishes with all these folks. Maybe that's just an American thing. You probably all read the lectionary. Okay, that's a good thing. Well, well finally she said, well, what, what was the passage? It was the Beatitudes which is the fourth Sunday of Epiphany, year C, every three years. I think that maybe that woman was hearing Jesus' words with fresh ears, that this is how the world works. This is the real world and not all these sham worlds that we put out. And interestingly enough, in Jesus' final address, his final public speech, Jesus becomes all of those things. He becomes the, the meek, those who mourn, the poor in spirit, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness or just hunger and thirst. Remember in Matthew 25, it's the judgment of the nations and the sheep and the goats become before him and Jesus said, blessed are you. He said, for I was hungry, I was thirsty, I was a stranger, I was naked, I was sick, I was in prison. Jesus becomes all of those blessings, those, those, those despised ones in the beatitude for us. But here's the wonderful promise that is realized because of the, of the work of God in Jesus Christ. It's not an, a goal or an ideal that awaits our action fulfillment. It is what God promises in Christ and promises to bring us to its service. We are not mere bystanders or spectators but actually have the joy and privilege in participating in the reconciling work God is working in the whole creation. When those sheep fed and gave drink and visited and welcomed those who were in prison or sick or were thirsty or naked or hungry, they were doing it as part of the reconciling work of Christ and as Jesus let them know, you were doing it to me. We're trying to make this clear, a couple of things. First of all, the Holy Family didn't have any papers when they had to flee to Egypt for their lives. Uh, but also, it's very clear in Scripture that when you welcome the stranger, you welcome me. And now we are called into this reconciling work. We are blessed to be a blessing. Your theme, called to journey together the ministry of reconciliation, speaks about this very thing. We're blessed not by what we do, but what has God has done for us and now sets us free, has blessed us, and calls us to serve those, to restore creation, to be reconciled with the first peoples of this land, to understand that multi-religious neighbors are actually children of God as much as we are, and that blessing them is a way that we bless God. This is a marvelous and, I would say, liberating promise. I used to think that the, the, uh, the Beatitudes were, were just really tough, if you think about it. And I know in the first parish I served, um, their people, their exterior lives were so perfect that no one knew the interior pain that was going on in every family's life. Because let me tell you, it happens in every family. I say, families, God's punishment for original sin. <laughs> These people, they would vacuum their lawns. They had leaf vacuums back then. They didn't blow, they vacuumed. I don't know why, but it was, that's how perfect they had to be. And God says, no, you don't have to keep up that pretense. You don't have to take that energy-destroying approach of constantly trying to make sure that you're fine and you're better than everyone else and everything's okay. I know it's not, God said. I usually preach against, and I'm going to do this now, what I call Billy Joel theology. He was a singer in the States in the 80s. Okay, well, we don't always know your singers, so I don't want to assume that you know. I mean, I know our, our, our culture is just like over, you know, like a blob, but okay, sorry. Anyways, Billy Joel had the song, and in it, the chorus was, I like you just the way you are. God does not like us just the way we are. That's why God sent Jesus. God likes us the way God will make us to be. In these words, 
we hear that we are blessed now. And in Jesus' final address, public speech, he turned himself into the one needing our help and our aid that we might be blessed to be a blessing. And this is the work of the ELCIC. You're such a model for me and for many in my church, particularly in the lead that you're taking in care of creation in trying to restore a right relationship with indigenous people here and also welcoming the stranger. I said this three years ago when Bishop Susan was at our assembly, you know, we're building walls and pieces and putting people in cages. Your prime minister was at the airport to welcome the first Syrian refugees. Don't ever give up and don't ever doubt first that you are blessed now not because of what we've done, but what God has done for us, and that God has enlisted us to be a blessing to the rest of the world. Amen. Please rise for our hymn of the day, number 715.
Let us together join in blessing Susan Johnson, who has been re-elected to serve in the office of National Bishop of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada. To you has been, has been being given the continuing care of the people and ministries of this church. We ask you in the presence of God and of this assembly. Will you be faithful in your office? Will you recommit yourself to this trust and responsibility in the confidence that it comes from God through the call of the church? I will, and I ask God to help me. Will you carry out this ministry in accordance with the Holy Scriptures and with the confessions of the Lutheran Church and in harmony with the Constitution of the Evangelical Church in Canada? I will, and I ask God to help me. Will you be diligent in your study of the Holy Scriptures and your use of the means of grace? Will you love, serve, and pray for God's people, nourish them with the word and sacraments, and lead them by your own example in faithful service and holy living? I will, and I ask God to help me. Will you give faithful witness in the world that God's love may be known in all that you do? I will, and I ask God to help me. Will you guide, encourage, and support the ministers and congregations of this church in their ministries? Will you be an advocate for the ministries of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada? And will you support this church's work with ecumenical and global partners? I will, and I ask God to help me. Almighty, Almighty God, God who has given you the, the will, will to do these things, things graciously give you the strength and compassion to perform them. Amen. People of God, representatives of this church, will you affirm Susan Johnson as a servant of God and a shepherd in the Church of Jesus Christ? If so, please say, we will and we ask God to help us. We will, we will and we ask God to help us. Will you pray for her, help and honor her for her work's sake, and in all things strive to live together in the peace and unity of Christ? We will, we will and we ask God to help us. Let us pray. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we give you thanks, but by your Holy Spirit, you sustain the church. By the power of the Holy Spirit, you call, gather, enlighten, and sanctify the whole church. Pour out your spirit upon Susan to empower and enlighten her ministry as bishop in your church. Sustain her as a shepherd who tends the flock of Christ with love and gentleness and oversees the ministries of the church with vision and wisdom. Uphold her as a faithful steward of your holy word and life-giving sacraments and a strong sign of reconciliation among all people. Give courage and fortitude to sustain her in this ministry. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, through whom all glory and power and honor are yours in your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. We join in giving thanks for your bishop, your national bishop, Susan Johnson. I now call on the National Church Council, those whose term continue and those who have just been elected and are present to come forward for installation, including the officers. Come on in.
These people have been elected to serve as officers of the church and members of the National Church Council. A reading from Romans. As in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function. So we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. Will you assume the office to which you have been elected? And will you endeavor to carry out its duties faithfully to the glory of Christ Jesus and in service to the one holy church? If so, say, I will, and I ask God to help me. And people of God, will you support and pray for the officers and members of the National Church Council in their work? We will, and we ask God to help us. The offices of Vice Chair, Secretary, Treasurer, and National Church Council are committed to you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, you call your people to service and give them very tasks in the world and in your church. Grant them grace and strength that they may serve you faithfully to the glory of your name through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Joining our voices with God's people now around the world, let us offer our prayers for those in need. And saying, let us pray and responding with, have mercy, O God. For the church, steadfast and faithful in its mission to proclaim reconciliation through Christ Jesus, for all who proclaim life and wholeness, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For areas affected by climate change, for those displaced as refugees, for those whose homelands are no longer hospitable, for those in danger of chaotic weather patterns, help us to change so that God's goodness is revealed in creation as we act with justice towards the earth and all creatures. Let us pray. Have mercy, O oh God. For lawyers and advocates, for local, regional, and national governments, and for peace throughout the world, help us to see where we have hurt our neighbors, and most especially our Indigenous treaty partners. Let reconciliation and right relationships be our future. Help us to set your justice free. Let us pray. Have mercy, O oh God. For those who feel ashamed, for those who find it <coughs> difficult to trust, for the bereaved and sick, especially those that we name silently in our hearts. That God provide compassionate and loving caregivers and peacemakers to all who suffer. Let us pray. Have mercy, O oh God. For the members of the body of Christ in this national convention, for those who do good works in our midst, for those who are visiting and those who are absent, that the Holy Spirit guide all the journeys of our lives as we take what we have seen and heard here back to our synods and homes. Let us pray. Have mercy, O oh God. In this year of celebrating the 75th anniversary of the Canadian Council of Churches, we give thanks for this enduring ecumenical partnership and pray for the continuing strength of the Council in the shared mission of responding to Christ's prayer for unity and peace, seeking Christ's truth with affection for diversity and acting together through prayer, 
dialogue and witness to the gospel. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. Merciful God, you hear the prayers of your people even before they are spoken. We commend these and all our prayers to you, trusting in your abundant mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Peace be with you. Our offering for today is for the ELCIC Praise Appeal. There are baskets on the tables and they will be picked up after our worship time.
Please rise. Let us pray together. God of mercy and grace, the eyes of all wait upon you, and you open your hand in blessing. Fill us with good things at your table, that we may come to the help of all those in need. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer and Lord. Amen. Just a few announcements about our communion time. All our bread is gluten-free. The aisle with the font will have one chalice with white grape juice on your left as you face the altar. Otherwise, there will be two chalices of wine in each aisle. The Lord be with you. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, you have brought us this far along the way. In times of bitterness, you did not abandon us, but guided us into the path of love and light. In every age, you sent prophets to make known your loving will for all humanity. The cry of the poor has become your own cry. Our hunger and thirst for justice is your own desire. In the fullness of time, you sent your chosen servant to preach good news to the afflicted, to break bread with the outcast and despised, and to ransom those in bondage to prejudice and sin. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to all, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ Christ has has died, died. Christ Christ is risen, risen. Christ Christ will will come again. again. Remembering therefore his death and resurrection, we await the day when Jesus shall return to free all the earth from the bonds of slavery and death. Come Lord Jesus, and let the church say amen. Amen. Send your Holy Spirit, our advocate, to fill the hearts of all who share this bread and cup with courage and wisdom to pursue love and justice in all the world. Come, spirit of freedom, and let the church say amen. Amen. 
Join our prayers and praise with your prophets and martyrs of every age, that rejoicing in the hope of the resurrection, we might live in the freedom and hope of your Son, through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Thanks be to God.
Please stand. And let us pray together. O oh God, our life, our strength, our food, we give you thanks for sustaining us with the body and blood of your Son. By your Holy Spirit, enliven us to be his body in the world, that more and more we will give you praise and serve your earth and its many peoples, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. The God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus. Amen. The God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The God of all grace bless you now and forever. Amen. Jesus said, you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. I chose you and appointed you to bear fruit at last. Remember, I will be with you always. To the end of time. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Direct us, Lord God, in all our doings with your most gracious favor and extend to us your continual help that in all our works begun continued and ended in you, we may glorify your name. And finally, by your mercy, bring us to everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I declare this assembly closed in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our sending hymn is number 843. Praise the one who breaks the darkness. and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.